So we, we have this moment in time where we can ask ourselves the question, from God's manual, from God's playbook, what is the smartest, wisest way to live the next 365 days blessing, being blessed, prospering from God's prosperity that he's given us in this new year. So how to live a blessed life in this coming year. And I, I, I come to the longest book of the Bible. All the individual Psalms, they make up a book, Psalms, plural. And this is Psalm 1 we're going to look at. But it's the largest book in the Bible. Uh, if Google's got it right, it's 2,461 verses. It has the longest chapter in the Bible, Psalm 119, which also lands right at the middle of the Bible. Wow, that's interesting. Longest book, longest chapter, longest chapter happens to be in the middle of the Bible, which is on the Word of God. Psalm 1 is on the Word of God. Psalm 119, the longest chapter in the Bible, is on the Word of God and how you need to know it, and, and you don't want to stray from it. You want to do it. And uh, it's really the only way. So I'm trying to say this. We cannot make it on this earth without alien technology. We need alien technology. The alien is God. <laughs> the technology is his word. It, it's really not, as you read from Genesis to Revelation, it, it can't be written over 3,000 years so uniting itself together, never contradicting itself. And it's a book about relationships, really. It's not about, you know, how to grow the corn the best. It's really about how to be right with God and have a good relationship with him. And out of that flows a good relationship with others. Marriage, kids, friendship, work ethics, community, uh, the church. And, and so we, we really come to understand that the Bible is really God's fingerprint on planet Earth. If you would, his, his DNA uh, upon this planet. Definitely it's a how-to manual. Okay, I don't know if you got anything for Christmas this year. We thought, I don't need those stinking directions. And you start to put it together. Have you guys learned you need the directions? Have you guys learned that? Yeah, I, I, you know, I can remember in my youth trying to put the kids' toys together and, you know, ending up going, there it is, with 10 extra pieces going, well, oh, isn't it supposed to do this, Dad? No, not this one. So, yeah, we really do need to follow the manual. Well, we look at Psalm 1, the first three verses. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, who stands in the path, nor stands in the path of the sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful. So you can see the progression. Walk, stand, sit. Don't even walk by their way where you can even listen to them and hear their philosophy of how to live or their thoughts on how they're viewing marriage or religion or politics or anything else. But so often we listen to foolishness, and if you listen to foolishness enough, it doesn't appear foolish anymore. Isn't that, isn't that interesting? You can hear something that's a total lie enough, it quits seeming like a, a lie. And as crazy as that is, you can come up with some very crazy things. But then if you stand there, why the other people are gathering around and they're all sharing in this great wisdom of the world, this ungodly counsel, then eventually it's like, hey, I'm going to sit right here and make this my place of abode. And then you begin to scorn the things of God, the things of God seem foolish to you. The truth seems an error to you. And all of a sudden, good is evil, and evil is good. So you got to say, so you can't be in a place where you're walking or standing or sitting 
absorbing the, the foolishness, the sinfulness, the, the anti-God, the, the anti-opposite of truth, and then go to God's word and it to affect you. Okay? If you ever, if you notice, you're, you're, the things of the flesh are strong. <laughs> the things of the world, peer pressure, to be a part of the group, to get along with other, the prayer, the pressure to, to hide your Christianity or to hide your own opinion and, and to at least look like you agree with the, the multitude, that pressure is hard. Satan is powerful. And, and God is saying, you, you've got to first realize, I need God. I need his truth. I want his truth. And I don't know what that truth is yet, but I know that what the world is spewing is not truth. And it's something God has to bring about, I believe, in the heart of every man. But once you now come and sit in the seat next to the godly with the Lord, blessed is the man. Oh, how happy is the man, he says. His delight is in the law of the Lord. So blessed is the man who has stopped the old stupid life of walking, standing, sitting with the ungodly. He's a blessed man just because he stopped it. The stupidity, the nonsense, the fleshliness, the sinfulness, the worldliness of it all. He's already blessed. But now when he comes to the word, he's going to be beyond blessed. Because now his heart is a... Is a empty warehouse where God can begin to fill his truths in on that. What's the truth about life? What's the truth about death? What's the truth about eternal life? What's the truth about marriage? What's the truth about sexuality? What's the truth uh, about being a friend? What's the truth of how to be a good employee? All of these truths relationally now can delight our soul. And you hear the truth of God's word and you delight in it. The word law, don't get thrown by that. that this is, David's writing this when there was just the first five books of the Bible, which is called the law, the Torah. So that was just the name of their Bible. David later in Psalm 119 will start referring to the Bible rather than the law. He'll often say the testimonies. He'll say the word. He uses a number of different words to, to say this. But again, this is just, for us, it's just the Bible. Delight yourself in the Bible, Genesis to Revelation. And in his law, God's law, God's principles, he meditates day and night. Now, I, I know so often people, whether, rather than a walk in relationship, just want a list of do's. You know, they just want to be able to check a box. And so I've heard people say this, read the Bible night and day. And you say, well, how, that's ridiculous. I can't read it while I'm sleeping. Well, let's go back. It doesn't say read the Bible, does it? It says meditate. And that liturgy is just thinking about it over and over again, taking it from the mind into the heart. It's interesting. It, it's also the word to purr like a kitten. Have you ever been blessed? I, I've been blessed. I hear somebody pray something, and I go, hmm, hmm, oh, true, amen, amen. Sometimes I hear somebody s s give a scripture, and I'm like, oh, oh, man, that, that is such a good word for me in this season. You sort of purr. Or to chew like a cow. To chew on the, uh, you know, it, you chew it, he regurgitates it from one stomach, chews on it some more, it goes in to the four stomachs and, and digest it. This is what he's saying. Once it gets in there, you're never letting it go. <laughs> what, I, what I meditated on a year ago, I'm back reading that same scripture, but this time when I'm meditating it, I find I'm meditating it out of a different stomach. <laughs> I'm meditating out of a different season in my life, in a different time in my pilgrimage. I'm meditating on a time where God's revealing to me from the same scripture, new revelation on, on what this passage means. And you know what? When I pass by it again, the third, fourth, fifth, 
100th time, God's going to continue to deepen me. It's an endless, infinite deepening that God can take us if we meditate in the Word. You see, they didn't have a Bible, right? I mean, really, the Bible, uh, the Gutenberg Press is, what, about 500 years ago. And then, of course, it was only for the super rich to have. And so, really, man having a book, a Bible like you can have, and of course now a lot of you guys have them in your cell phones. I do. But if you had a Bible, a literal Bible with you, that's only happened in the last 100 years, maybe a little bit more now, that that was possible for the average everyday man to be able to have such a thing. So out of the 2,000 years since Christ, and so we sort of went from meditating to reading, so you used to have to wait till synagogue. <laughs> You'd go and, and, and the rabbi would roll out the big uh, scroll. Same in Christianity, really. It was scrolls. They'd roll out Paul's Ephesians here and read the scroll. Uh, and you would go there and hear it. And of course, you didn't have a lot of that stuff going on. So you, 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 you didn't have a lot of other voices and a lot of other channels. You didn't have 13 million radio channels and, and 13 zillion television channels and, and all this n noise coming from all over the place. You just had a couple of channels in such a simple society. So since you just had a couple of channels, you could really hone in on that channel when you're at church and really get it all, soak it all in and meditate and talk. And you sort of quote it and go, no, I don't think that's the word. I think that was the word. Wow, okay, that's true. We got, we got to go and look at that at the synagogue. And that's the way you'd meditate and talk about it with each other as you stew on it, even when you're consciously doing it and then when you're sleeping or not consciously doing it. And it says, he will be like a tree planted by the rivers of water. I used to love to take my elders to the desert for two or three days. We'd go out to Borrego, and there's this long walk. You can go a couple of miles, and it's just desert as desert can get. But all of a sudden, there's this oasis, this pond, a good-sized pond, and a couple of waterfalls, and trees, and bushes, and shade. And what it was, was from the mountain up there, was a spring. And the spring was very, very deep underneath the ground. Um, and so you, even though the desert was incredibly dry, that particular area was very lush. And this is what he's talking about. You're a tree and you're not affected by the weather systems of the world. You're tapped in to the water source way down deep. If everybody else is drying out, you've got plenty of water. You're going to be absolutely lush and flourishing because you're not being affected by the world around us uh, as much because you're tapped into the waters, the rivers of waters. That's the Bible, guys. The Bible is the waters, rivers of water. Jesus, in, in Ephesians 5, we're going to see, he washes us in the water of the word, the rivers of water, the word of God. We're a tree. The water is, is the key element to cause this tree to be strong and to grow. And he'll bring forth fruit in his season. We're not fruitful year-round. We, we go in seasons. Boy, we're, we're, we go through a season of Job. Boy, these last few years, I, I don't know if it's just me being more aware of it, but I've seen some people go through things that it's just one thing after the next, after the next, after the next, and I'm just sort of in shock, going, surely this is ending soon, and boy, it doesn't end. One thing after the next. Like Job, every area of their life uh, going through the grinder. And, and you, you, you realize, man, there's a season of trials that last a lot longer than I have experienced myself. And then there's just seasons again of, of happy seasons, relaxing, resting seasons. Then there's seasons you're pulling the weeds and working hard in the farm. Fixing the tractors, there's just different seasons. And the season of, of harvesting, it's a wonderful season, but it doesn't come as often as I would like. <laughs> I'd like to, to bear fruit more often than just a very short season. Uh, I grew up in the farm country, and I'm telling you, you're working hard on your harvest, and within a week you've harvested it, and it's gone. All those months of work 
over in a flash, and then you're plowing the field up back to dirt. It's a short season, never quite long enough. But here's a supernatural thing, whose leaf also shall not wither. Wow, what a tree. And then whatever he does shall prosper. God pulled out the grand poobah of all blessings. Think about it. You cannot come up with a greater blessing than this. Well, the Bible says you'll prosper in all that you do if, if you meditate on the word day and night. But there's a greater blessing. What? What would the greater blessing be? You'll prosper in all that you do? <laughs> there isn't one. Think about it. You can't go a next step. God said the greatest blessing that can be disposed on man, I'm going to give it in tandem, connected to the meditation of the word. So I'm sure you've all noticed that anything that's spiritual, our body hates. <laughs> the world hates. Satan definitely hates it and wants you to hate it. And so any, anything, doesn't matter how small it is. Man, I, I, I literally have been with pastors out in the middle of nowhere America. And there's this little cross they put on a hill. And nobody can see it, but maybe three people a year. And the ACLU is suing them, putting millions of dollars to get that little cross off that little hill. It's amazing to me. I'm like, wow. Satan does not like something like this, two pieces of stick on a hill. He does not. He, he's, that's how in, in, in intimidated he gets. That's how paranoid he is. That's how hateful he is. So believe me, if you start meditating on the word, Satan's going to show up. The ACLU will probably show up today. Meditate on the Bible, take your kids away. Meditate on the Bible, we're going to fire you. It, it's crazy. The world we're in is absolutely absurd. And so, again, it comes back to God saying, I want you to understand, out of all the spiritual duties, coming to church is one of those, praying is one of those, worshiping with our hearts, making melody, sure, speaking to one another, evangelism, encouraging one another, a lot of spiritual duties. I, I, I think none of them we ever feel like doing. We've got to kick ourselves and prod ourselves and beat ourselves, you know, like a stubborn mule. We've got, we got to get it going. And once we get going, we're okay. But he's saying here, don't miss the word. It's the element that flows in everything else. Later, Jesus is going to say, as you abide in him and abide in the word, you'll pray. Prayer comes out of the word. And, and again, I, I purposed in, me and Cheryl purposed in our hearts, the time our kids were 12 years old, you know, in the Jewish culture, that's the bar mitzvah. They become a man. The, our kids would know all of the Bible. We didn't leave it up to Sunday school teachers. We just had devotions every day and just kept going through the scriptures until they knew every story and and uh, sure enough, man, by the time they're 12, it's hard to, to rope them to sit down <laughs> very long after that. You can have devotionals, but they're, they're short. But I, I do believe that uh, that is the key to your kid's salvation and safety in such a wicked and perverse generation. Uh, get, you be the first to get information in their hearts on every issue. But he says there, you'll bear the fruit in your season. Your leaf won't wither, which on fruit trees, it always happens. They always got to go through a time uh, of withering to, to be able to shed the leaves and, and, and to get pruned, to be able to bear more in the next season. But not so in this. The supernatural element comes in where, you, you know, sort of in the millennial period tree. <laughs> it never has a, a season where even a leaf dies. And then whatever he does, shall prosper. Remember in Deuteronomy 28, Moses put the people on Grisim and Ebal. Grisim was the blessings, Ebal was the cursings. And they, they shouted out, you can go read Deuteronomy 28. If you hear God's word and obey it, 
And then they give all the blessings. God's going to bless you in the city. He's going to bless you in the country. He's going to bless you in the home. He's going to bless you outside the home. He's going to bless you in the needing bowls. He's going to bless you in the herds. And then he goes and says, finally, it's, it's like, a, like a wolf catching its prey. God's going to gr- come on you on top of you and, and grab a hold of you. And, and he's going to bl- drown you in blessings. He's going to attack you and overwhelm you with blessings. God's opening the windows of heaven and pours out blessings. Literally, we're drowning him. We've got to say, turn it off. No more. It's like getting tickled. Kids want you to tickle them until you tickle them. Then they want you to stop tickling them. You can get too much tickling pretty quick. Well, this is what God is saying. And again, it's so simple. It's not like the Muslims where you got to carry your rug around and face it east and pray an hour this rote prayer. It's not like the Catholics carrying a rosary around and, and praying the different recited verses. It's not like the Hare Krishnas, you know, get your ponytail and shave your head and get your ponytail and get your beads. Hare Hare Krishna, Krishna Rama, Rama. Hare Hare Krishna, Krishna Rama, 90 times a day or 90 times, three times a day. It's not like Jehovah's Witnesses, you got to get in your suit and get your briefcase and go knocking on doors. You, you could, you, I can just, you're a truck driver. I can meditate in God's word. You're a doctor. I can meditate in God's word. It, whatever you do, right? We can just sort of weave in and weave out. Whatever I'm doing, the word of God is on my heart and on my mind, and I'm meditating on it. Well, here's nine areas. The first one is, the blessed is the man because he delights in the law of the Lord. Or literally, he makes God's word his delight. It's not going to happen on his own. It's something you've got to create an appetite and make yourself enjoy it. In Psalm 19, verse 7 through 11, we, we need to understand, number one, to understand the value of God's word. Do you understand how valuable God's word is? The law of the Lord is what? Perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The statutes of the Lord are right in rejoicing the heart. The commandments of the Lord are pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear or the honor, respect of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord, another way of saying the Bible, Uh, are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold. Yes, much fine gold, the best of the best of the gold, gold bullion, sweeter also than the honey in the honeycomb. Moreover, by them your servant is warned, and in keeping them there is great reward. You're warned and rewarded. The honey in the honeycomb, the sweetest. Boy, I just had that. My, My... Son, he, they had bought, a, you can buy a little thing of, of honey in the honeycomb. Have you seen that? You, you got a little of it and put it on a cracker. Oh, man, it just feels like health. It's amazing how rich and wonderful of a taste that is. I, I had a friend who was back on the East Coast, and, and he, he grew up sort of near the Amish, and they would make this fudge. And and. He said growing up as a kid, he didn't realize what he had until he moved out here. And, and since then, he, he can't eat any fudge. And people say, I'll try my fudge, and he'll try it. Nope. And his saying was, this is what happened to him when he came to Christ. When you find the sweetest of the sweet, when you find the best of the best, you never enjoy anything but the best. And when we have Jesus through his word, we've got the sweetest of the sweetest. Nothing else will satisfy but that sweetness of Jesus and his word. Notice what it does. It it converts the soul. It makes wise the foolish people. Simple, that's a nice way of saying fools. It rejoices the heart. We need rejoicing these days, don't we? We're in a sad world. We're in a very stressful world. We're in a very idiotic world. You know, it's like us reading Isaiah where it says, God looks down on the orb of the earth and all these men are getting lined up and put to death for 
believing the Bible, believing the, the earth is round when everybody else thought the world was flat. So all the flat earthers are killing all the people to, who believe the Bible that the earth is round. We're, we're, we're here now going, God made man and woman, and, and we are, you know, ready to get burned to the stake by saying, no, there's not a million genders. And, and no, homosexuality is not natural, and, and it's, it's not something God can bless, and it is a sin. And, and I'm not saying you're e- more evil than anybody else. It just, it, I'm not going to back off from what the values of what God's given me, who's the creator of the heavens and the earth. And so, it, again, it rejoices the heart. It enlightens the eyes. It endures forever. It's perfect, sure, right, pure. It's enduring forever. It's true and righteous. More to be desired than the best of gold. It's sweeter than the sweetest and the best on the earth, the honey and the honeycomb. Be warned and be rewarded by keeping it. Psalm 119, verse 14 I have rejoiced in the way of your testimonies as much as in what? All riches. Psalm 119, 162, I rejoice in your word as one who finds great treasure. How does the psalmist look at the Bible? There's no greater riches. I mean, 100 years out of 2,000 since Christ rose from the dead, How many Christians in those 1,900 years who understood they could have a Bible, the entire Bible, Genesis to Revelation, in their hands that they could take home? I mean, imagine the first time a guy picks it up and is like, how does this work? I don't, it doesn't feel right. It feels like you need a scroll and you need to smell mildew and dust and, (laughs) you know, and it should take five people to read this passage. All I got to do is turn a page and there it is. David, who had access to it as the king, was saying, I'm the richest man in the world because God's truth, the creator of the heavens and the earth, all that he has for man, lacking nothing, I have in my disposal. Well, number two, blessed is the man who understands the perfection of God's word. In Psalms 12, verse 6 and 7, the words of the Lord are pure words, like silver tried in the furnace of earth, purified seven times. You, saying to God, shall keep them, O Lord. You shall preserve them from this generation, what? Forever. So he's saying it's like taking all the dross out of silver or out of gold. You know how they do that? They heat it up and they take the other alloys out. They heat it up more, get more other alloys out, and and you start purifying. You got, you know, 14 karat gold, 18 karat gold keeps going up until you got up here. And he's saying here, it's liquid. All the alloys are gone. It's just a liquid gold or liquid silver, seven times. And this purity will last forever because God, by his power, is going to keep it. What did Jesus say? It'd be easier for heaven and earth to pass away than from one breath mark or one annunciation symbol to be to pass away. It'd be easier. That's how protected and, and, and sure that it is by God. Psalm 1830, as for God, his way is what? Perfect. The word of the Lord is proven. Again, tested over and over and over again. He is a shield to all who trust in him. So everybody who trusts in God and trusts in his word, they're going to find that there's a shield that God has over their life. Psalm 197, the law of the Lord is perfect. There it is. We had read it a minute ago converting or restoring or reviving the soul. Have you, have you guys who've lived long as I have lived, can you remember decades when things weren't so heavy? Decades when things weren't so negative? Things that people weren't so critical and fault-finding and, and bitter? I, I can remember when people weren't like that. It's like people on the freeway are waiting for somebody to offend them. You can't offend me, you're offending me. In the grocery store, hey, you're offending me. At work, you're offending me. You're offending me. It's like, it's like 
dude, I just want to buy a loaf of bread. I, I, it's crazy. Boy, we need God's word more than ever before to be a shield to us, to restore us, to revive us. We need it daily now. Thirdly, blessed is a man who understands it's the way we grow in our spiritual man, that inner man, that God would grant according to the riches of glory to be strengthened with might through the spirit in the inner man. How does that happen? Matthew 4, 4 makes it clear. It's through the word of God. Jesus is, and I'll quoting out of Deuteronomy, man shall not live by bread alone, but by what? Every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. You know, guys, it's crazy, but I, I grew up in a church and nobody read the Bible. Or very, very few, I should say, read the Bible. And the pastor didn't really preach the Bible. He would say a verse and then give a very social message. And you're trying to get some kind of spiritual meat out of it. It was very hard to do. And <clears throat> the word of God, though, it is every word. Genesis, Malachi, Peter, John, Revelation, all the Bible. God has something to speak to you. George Mueller, the great man of faith. If you don't know who that is, Google it and read a story on him. Read a book on it. I read many. But he said it's like the four seasons of the year. A Christian should read the Bible four times a year. And you know what? It's not that much. If you sat down and read the whole Bible from Genesis to Revelation, it takes 72 hours. If you break that down, it's about 20 minutes a day. It's about 10 chapters a day. And, you know, again, some parts of the Bible are a little more filled with data than other parts of the Bible, more narrative storyline. But yet, it, was, it would not be that hard to spend 10 minutes in the morning, 10 minutes in the evening. You'd read the entire Bible through in about three and a half months. Well, that's food for thought there, but every word God wants you to have. Interesting, in John 17, when Jesus is praying for the disciples and for us who had become disciples through the, his disciples, he said, Lord, I've given them your word and it's in the Greek, the word logos. And you go, why did he do that? Because in verse 8, he said, the words, I give them your words. He's repeating himself now. But no, in the Greek, it's the word rhema. The word logos is the written word of God. The word rhema is what God has to speak to you out of the written word of God. How it applies to your life. So one's knowledge and the other is wisdom. And honestly, knowledge doesn't really help you a lot. And there's people who know a lot of information that live very foolish lives. They know how to live much better than they really do. It's always funny when you watch those doctor shows or those hospital shows where all the doctors go outside and smoke, you know, chain smoke in between uh, patients. And it's like, they know better. I mean, if anybody knows about how bad smoking is, the doctors do, but yet they smoke anyway. So knowing information and then understand how to apply that information and then consistently do it, that's, that's a gift of God. And so manna, remember they did that every morning what, before the sun got hot, he would go out and get manna for himself and for his whole family. Boy, I think that's a great analogy of how God wants us to live. Matter of fact, Jesus prophesying about when he would be on earth, listen to this, in verse 4 and 5 of Isaiah 50, the Lord God has given me the tongue of the learned, the Greek word disciple, he's given me the tongue of a disciple, that I should know how to speak a word in season, the rhema word, to him who is weary. He awakens me morning by morning. He awakens my ear to hear as the learned, as a disciple. The Lord God has opened my ear, and I was not rebellious, he had to fight his flesh like we all do, nor did I turn away. So I beat my body in subjection and, and, and listened to the Father. I didn't go back to sleep. We, if you, verse 6 makes it clear this is Jesus. He goes on, now changing, but it's the same context. I gave my back to those who struck me, my cheeks to those who plucked out my beard, 
and, and so on, spitting on me and, and the shame that came with heading, carrying the patabulum on the way to the cross. And so <clears throat> Jesus' pattern was before the sun rose, <laughs> before it got hot, before it burned away, that rhema word of God. He, he allowed the Father morning by morning to quicken his heart, and then he had that word to the rich young ruler. He knew where to be for the woman at the well. He had the word in season. He knew what to do because the Father had spoken it to him morning by morning. Well, fourth thing is blessed is a man who understands that his strength, that it strengthens our lives and our faith. How do we get a stronger faith? How do we get a stronger life? Again, it's the word. Psalm 119, 28, my soul melts from heaviness. Strengthen me according to your word. Romans 10, 17, faith comes by hearing and hearing by what? The word of God. In verse 5, blessed is a man who understands that all scripture has been given to him, you individually, us, that we can be complete, thoroughly equipped. If you know every word of God, you'll lack no wisdom, no power, no strengthening from God through all the crazy seasons we have been through and are going through. In 2 Timothy 3, 16 to 17, all scripture, even some of the mundane passages and genealogies, all of it, it's been given by the inspiration of God. In the Greek, literally, God breathed. And it's profitable for doctrine, reproof, for correction, for instruction, righteousness, for our own life, for God to reprove us, for God to spank us, to God to lead us in righteousness, and then also for us to know, to help those in our sphere of influence, to help lead them in righteousness, and to help correct them. That the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for what? Every good work. You need to go no further. And then number six, blessed is the man who understands it gives us power to overcome sin. Psalm 119, verse 9, how will a young man cleanse his way? There it is, by taking heed according to God's word. It's spiritual, guys. It's not about a bunch of information. It's about spiritual meditation. Gets into our mind. We meditate on it. It gets into our soul, into our spirit. And, and without knowing it, we have this spiritual strength to overcome sin that we didn't know we had. All we know is, is we said no, and we, we didn't end up in a very bad situation. And you're wondering, how did that happen? Well, it, it's spiritual. It happened by that constant meditating on God's word, God cleansing your soul, cleansing your heart, taking your foolish mind and making it wise. So many Angles, the word of God helps us. Psalms 119, 11, your word I have, what? Hidden in my heart through meditation again that I might not sin against you. The blessed man is the one who, number seven, understands the word is the key to sanctification. In John 17, 17, sanctify them by your word, by your truth. Your word is truth. Where do we find pure truth that's been proven, tested, will last forever? That truth? It's the Bible. In Ephesians 5.26, he said that he might sanctify and cleanse her, the church, us, the believers, with the washing of the water by what? The word. He sanctifies us and cleanses us through the word. Ephesians 6.17, you guys know that. The only offensive weapon a Christian has is the sword of the Spirit, the Word of God. And boy, do we need weapon. Do we need the weapon to go into the world these days? Number eight, blessed is a man who understands it gives him great power in prayer. Interesting, in John 15, 7, if you abide in me and what? My words abide. Again, I'm meditating. Abide in you. You will ask what you desire and what? It shall be done for you. Wow. You're praying 
through the truth of God's word, you're praying through the filtering of God's word that's been meditating on. Hopefully, some of you older people, you've been doing this for days, weeks, months, years, decades, half a decade. You've been meditating on God's word. We're the light to the world, the salt to the earth. We, we can't help but bring great influence to wherever we go. And when we come to God and we pray, there's great power. Blessed is the man, number nine, drum roll please. Blessed is the man who understands that the word helps us truthfully see where we are and helps us guide us to know where we need to go next. Psalm 119, 105. The word is a lamp to my feet and what? A light to my path. Psalm 1 and Joshua 1 are similar. But Joshua, Moses is gone. He's thinking, I cannot fill Moses' shoes. I don't even want to be a leader. I just want to be a guy who's in the background. I don't want to be at the head of anything, especially uh, the nation of Israel. He, he really did not want this job. Uh, Moses didn't want the job to begin with as well. <laughs> Starting to see a pattern there. But God says... He, it, it, if you, if you understand the word of God and apply it to your life in the right way, you're only going to prosper, Joshua. So really, the reason you don't want to lead is because you're afraid you might fail. Isn't that the, often the reason we don't step out and try to do something or try to sway others? Because I might fail. I don't want to share the Lord because they might look at me and spit on me and, and I'll fail. No. Listen to what he says to us. Let this be to you. God speaking to you as you're going into this new era, into this new year of 2023. Crazy. 2023, as you go into this new era, guys, we are in the last days. Love is growing cold. Parents betraying children. Children betraying parents. The days of Sodom and Gomorrah I can remember when I first started pastoring 40 years ago, I, I said, someday there's going to be a, a homosexuality permeating, permeating the earth. I had people mad at me for saying that. People upset going, that's ridiculous. And I'm like, it's right there as clear as day in the Bible. Yeah, it's going to happen. And it's gonna, I don't think it's going to take 100 years to get there. I think it's going to get there overnight. And th this is what the Bible tells us. It's going to happen quickly, quickly in speed. Days will be as the days of Noah. Violence permeated the earth. The heart of man was evil continually. We are in a violent world. People are mad. People are upset. People are living this hurt. They're all in hurt, and they want to go hurt others. And, and it's, it's an insane world. But yet, we can be conquerors even in this. So picture you now rising up to be the leader in your sphere of influence. And this is what the Lord is saying to you. No man shall be able to stand before you all the days of your life. It says in Joshua 1.5. As I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will not leave you nor forsake you. Be strong, verse 6 says, and of good courage. For to this people you shall divide an inheritance of the land which I swore to your fathers to give them. Number seven, verse seven, only be strong and very courageous. Here's the key that you may observe to do according to all that the law which Moses, my servant, commanded you. Do not turn from it to the right hand or to the left that you may prosper wherever you go. There it is. That it may prosper wherever you go. The book of the law shall not depart from your mouth like a cow. You're chewing on it, chewing on your cud nonstop. But you shall meditate in it day and night that you may observe to do according to all that's written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous. Then you will have, what? Good successors. Success of this world. The devil will actually give you success. Um, you know, those who are rich in this world uh, become very minimal in character and, and it's like trying to get a camel through the eye of the needle to get him into heaven so we don't want any prosperity we want the prosperity god is giving to us 
of good prosperity. Verse 9, have I not commanded you, be strong and of good courage. Don't be afraid. That's, that's one of the powerful things against Satan. Don't look afraid. Don't be afraid. Nor be dismayed. Don't, don't, don't uh, be a victim. Don't be sad in your heart. For the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. So Lord, we once again thank you for this day that you've given us. And we thank you for the time we've been able to spend together. And Lord, we understand that this Bible in front of us is from the very designer. It is your manual. It is your blueprint. It is your truth alone that, that is true. Let every man be liar, but our God be found true. What you say about man, about marriage, about sexuality, about the workplace, about money, about life, about death, what you say is true. And Lord, we would come to take your word and realize man can't live. We can't, we can't, we can only exist. We can't live by bread alone, but how we live and then prosper. And we don't have to be afraid. We don't have to be dismayed. We, our, our leaf won't even wither. We'll bear fruit in our season if we come to live that life where we're eating the manna. The Logos word, and more importantly, as we meditate on it, the Rhema word. Just like you, Jesus, we'd have the word not only for our own souls, but we'd have a word for the weary in the day. The woman at the well, the rich young ruler, and whoever else may come our way, that we would have that supernatural life and supernatural wisdom from you. And we thank you so very, very much. And all God's people said, amen, amen. amen.